terms of announcements, I just want to remind you the final is two weeks from today. Uh, at night, kind of late, 8.15. Uh, it's two and a half hours long. Well, we have two and a half hours allocated, which means that if you take the train um, and go far, life kind of sucks because it's very late. Um, <coughs> The, the locations are different, so you should not be in the same place where you took the, the midterms. Um, sections, well, the sections for this lecture, plus recitation two. So that's the recitations of Cha, uh, uh, who's <coughs> Aton? Yeah, Aton, uh, Patricio, why didn't, well, anyway, Yes, Lei Cha, Patricio, Aton, and Robert are in the Union Auditorium, and the other ones are in Earth and Space. Okay? Also, um, you should do your course evaluation. The course evaluations, you probably got an email saying, please do that. They close them on the last day of classes, so you need to do them before Monday. It's really useful information for us to know, to have your comments about the course. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Something like 10 people have done it so far, which is not a big response. So maybe the rest of you will do it sometime this week. I think you have two for this class, one for the recitation and one for the lecture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that everything from the first day has a chance of being on the exam, but slightly more of the problems will be on stuff since the last midterm. So that's the stuff, Taylor series and this differential equation stuff, there'll be a few more, slightly so. Polar stuff was on the last exam that would still possibly be on the final. So, something like, let's say, half of the exam, maybe 40% of the exam, a slight tilt towards the differential equations and Taylor series stuff. Um, but the other two thirds of the course will also be represented. Okay, other questions? Alright, so we still have some material to get through, so we should do that. Um, if you remember, we were talking about uh, these predator prey equations, so I didn't write this thing before. So, this is uh, Locke and Volterra, just named after uh, two people who studied this uh, in the early 20th century. Yeah, in the early 20th century, um, which the model that we're talking about, we have two populations, and even though it's a predator prey model, these techniques also apply in economics and also, in fact, I'll, I'll say towards the end of the class, if I get to it, also in, in physics. Um, but the differential equations that we're looking at here, we have two variables. Um, so let's say we have some rabbits who are written by, say, R of t is their population, and some foxes. Well, F of T. Last time they were dingoes written with a W and I got too confused, so they're just foxes. It's easier. Um, and the rabbits uh, have the property that they grow, uh, not K, A. Let's call it the leg. They, in, in the absence of foxes, their population. 
there's a 10. Sorry. What am I doing? It doesn't matter. I want to call it A. Sorry. I want to call it A. So in the absence of foxes, they grow uh, exponentially. And the foxes, in the absence of, of rabbits, well, they have nothing to eat. So their population will die off exponentially. Right? So again, remember the reason the, 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 the growth rate is proportional to the amount present. And for the foxes, the rate at which they die off is proportional to the amount of foxes there are. And, but of course, the foxes eat the rabbits. So when they encounter a rabbit, then they get to have more foxes. So, they shouldn't use me. Oh well, too bad. Um, so the boost to their population is proportional to the encounters that they have with the rabbits, which is proportional to the product. Right? So when foxes meet rabbits, they get some kind of a boost. But of course, when foxes meet rabbits, it's not nice for the rabbits. Although once in a while they get away. So there are these four constants, A, B, C, and D. And here, in this, the way this is written, everything's positive. We'll change it to be not positive soon. Um, and so this is the model, and just the way it's written is just the way you would think of it. They would grow naturally in the absence of foxes, but meeting a fox causes them, their population, to decrease. And similarly, the foxes would naturally die off in the absence of rabbits, but meeting a rabbit causes them to enable to survive and reproduce. And so, notice that here we have two, so we have a system of two differential equations. And in fact, typically, well not typically, but very often, differential equations describe more than one thing. We have systems of equations. Um, and so we want to use some of the ideas that we've already had to that we've already covered to understand this system. Um, and one thing that we can see right away, I put it up there, but let me put it here. Notice that if, if r uh, is zero, we understand what happens, or if w equals zero, we understand. So we know what happens when the rabbit population is zero. If r equals zero, then the r doesn't change. And you can't read the word understand. So if r equals zero, we know what happens. So if there's no rabbits, then the wolf, then the then the rabbit population, well, if there's no rabbits, they don't magically appear. And the fox population grows exponentially. Uh, I have a C there, or dies off exponentially. I guess I should call this B. Something like that. So we understand everything that happens if the rabbit population is zero. And similarly, we understand everything that happens. Then we know that if there's no foxes, there's always no foxes, and that the rabbits grow exponentially. I used it like that. Yeah. So imagine that you put, you mean, why do they live exponentially? I mean, why don't they just all live for two months and then die? Yeah. Well, it's just a model. <laughs> so, I mean, that's probably what would happen if there was absolutely nothing for the fox. Well, okay, the foxes eat each other. They're very hungry, so they eat each other. And they die off exponentially because they eat each other. How's that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so, so that tells us we can't really make a picture, though we can, but... So there's one other situation where we understand here, and if I rewrite this as... Uh, if I rewrite this as R, how about we call it actually back to the A out? AR times 1 minus B over A F. And if I factor the negative C out here, 1 plus, actually it's minus, isn't it? 1 minus D over C R. So I just factored both sides of the equation. And here we can see one other situation when we know everything that happens. If the ratio, if the, if the ratio of, if, if the ratio, if the number of foxes is, is uh, A over B, and the number of rabbits is C over D, So for these numbers C and D, if F equals A over B and R equals C over D, then, well, if F is A over B, then DR DT is zero. So in this case, and if R is C over D, then DF DT is zero. So in this case, f of t is always a over t, and r of t is always c over d. Right? So, if I'm at this special value, where the number of foxes is exactly a over b, and the number of rabbits is exactly c over d, nothing changes. So I want to represent that graphically, like I did at the end of the last class. So here I'm going to make what's called a, a phase portrait. Also sometimes it's called a phase diagram. Where I'm going to put the number of rabbits here, and I'm going to put the number, I want to do it a little further over, sorry. I'm going to put the number of rabbits here, and I'm going to put the number of foxes here. And I'm going to suppress time. So I'm going to think of looking at the ratio of foxes, the, re the relationship between foxes and rabbits. So we know what happens when there's no foxes. If you have no foxes, I mean no rabbits, you stay with no rabbits and the population of the foxes declines. If you have, and if you have nothing, no rabbits, no foxes, then you have to wait a very long time for them to spontaneously generate, so it just stays with no rabbits, no foxes. If you have a few rabbits, then you get lots more rabbits. And then you get more and more and more. And then we also have this special value here, when f is a over b, and when r is c over d, that if you start with that ratio, you keep that ratio. And now we want to figure out how to analyze what goes on. Suppose I have a population. Do you want me to use actual numbers here? Last time I got no mostly. Now I'm getting yes. Okay, how many people want me to use actual values for A, B, C? How many people are happy with A, B, C? Sorry, people with actual numbers. Just imagine A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and D is 4. So it's like 2 to 1. They want A, B, C, D. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's just imagine. Now, suppose I had, uh, so let's, let's figure C over D, just, just for talking sake, C is twice D, so this is 2. And 
that uh, A is twice B, so this is 2. So suppose I have an equal population of rabbits and foxes, but not too many of either one. So I'm starting here where both populations are positive but kind of small. I have 100 rabbits and 100 foxes. Well, yeah, whatever. Okay? So I'm starting here where I have a small number of rabbits and a small number of foxes. What will happen? Well, we can figure it out by looking at, there's going to be some curve here, and we don't know whether what will happen is the, the rabbit, the fox rate will grow and the rabbit rate will both grow, or maybe they'll die off, or maybe the rabbits will just grow. It's highly unlikely that if we have some, both of them will, will shrink. So what we want to look at is, so, Let's imagine that there's some curve here representing the evolution of F over R, representing the evolution of the ratio of foxes to rabbits. Then what will happen here? Well, we'll have some tangent curve, some tangent line here. And the tangent to this by the chain rule, so we imagine, so we, we imagine that there's some function, I don't know why, which is uh, f of t, I want f, well, there's some function y of t, which depends y, which, which describes both f and r. What will happen, what will be the tangent here? Well, by the chain rule, slope here is going to be the change in F divided by the change in R. Oh. Right, so DFDR, let's just call that DFDR. Right? If, if, the, if the, at least for a little while, the number of foxes is controlled exactly by the number of rabbits, then the tangent line is just going to be the ratio of the two slopes here. So we can figure out what's going to happen. We can plot a direction field here just by looking at the right-hand side here and the right-hand side here we can see what the slopes are going to be. So in this region, what is, so if, if, uh, so I guess, let me put it up. So if F is less than A over B, and R is less than C over D, and what do we know about df, dr, dt, and dr, dt? So we we'll look at this equation here. And f is less than a over b. So what does that tell us about this? Does anybody have a clue what I'm talking about? No. Okay, imagine A over B is 2. So I have this equation. Uh, where'd it go? I have that equation. Everything is positive. A, B, C, D, everything is positive. Oh yeah, that's what I meant. Oh, I see, I swapped them. So, suppose that f is less than 2. What do I know about dr dt? 
f is less than 2 and bigger than 0. R is some number. What do I know about R and T, E, R, D, T? Yeah? E, R, D, T is increasing? Well, it's not increasing, it's positive. So the function, so R is increasing. Right? So if f is small, but positive, and r is whatever it is, then r is increasing. Right? So that says, in this case, here, the r dt is bigger than zero. Yeah? Oh, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. And then, yeah, a and b. Okay, so when f is small, they're supposed to be the same. When we're here, so my question is, when we're here, is df dt positive? I mean, d r dt is it positive or negative? And when we're here, when we're in this region, f is small and r is small. So if f is small, this is positive, and if r is small. Well, this is positive, but that makes it negative. So here, in this region, R prime is positive and F prime is negative. What about if we're in this region here, where F is still small, so F is small, so R prime is positive. But now R is big. So F is small and R is big. Well, if F is small and R is big, when F is small, this is still negative. But now R is big, so this becomes negative 2. So I have negative times positive times negative, which gives me positive. If we're in this region here, so now, well, let's come back to here. F is small, but, oh, I'm sorry, R is small, but F is big. So, if R is small, then that tells me that df dt is now negative. Yes. But, f is big, which means that this, the rdt, is also negative. And the last case, obviously, if f is, if r is big, then f prime is positive, and if f is also big, then r prime is negative. So I was planning to do it here, but I guess I'll draw this picture here. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that if we look in this plane, which is divided into four bits, R prime is in here. R prime is positive, F prime is negative. That means that things are going like that. At this point, right here, is where F prime transitions from negative to positive, so it goes straight across. And in this region, things go up. And then here, at this point, is where uh, R prime is transitioning from positive to negative. So things continue to go up, but then they go this way. And we get something that looks like that. So what is this doing? This is describing 
So if we take a particular solution and we let it run, you'll get something that looks like that. This is a, a depiction of how the fox population varies with the rabbit population. So let's look at this now in terms of just what happens to the foxes in terms of time. So now I'm going to put time here, and I'm going to put the number of foxes here. If I start, say, here, at this point, and I let time run, um, maybe I can do this, then the number of foxes decreases, then it increases back, then it continues to increase, then it decreases. Well, okay, I ran out of space. But we see an oscillation here in the number of foxes. As you trace out this curve, the ratio of foxes to rabbits goes around this circle. This is just the projection of this circle in this way, but with a time component added. So for this initial condition, it increases, then decreases, and increases, then decreases. We can do the same thing. Should I draw it down here? Maybe I'll just draw it down here. I'll draw it below. If we look at the rabbit population, the same business is going to happen, except that we're starting here where the rabbits will initially increase. Right? Horizontal motion is motion of rabbits, is up for rabbits. And vertical motion is foxes. So here, if we start at this same initial condition right there, then we initially have some number of rabbits. And as time increases, the rabbits increase. But then they start to tail off. And then they decrease. Uh, and somehow, I'm off a little bit. So the minimum of foxes occurs while the rabbits in the middle of the rabbits increasing. The maximum of rabbits is the maximum of foxes occurs when the rabbits change. So we have something like that. So I'm, I'm not lining them up very well. These peaks are not occurring right. I'm sorry. Okay. We start with the minimum of rabbits here. Then we go a quarter, a quarter of a loop. The foxes are at their minimum, but the rabbits are somewhere in the middle. So that's here. Then we go another bit more. The fox population is now in its middle. That's here. But the rabbit population has now achieved its max, so that's here. <clears throat> and then we go another quarter turn, the rabbits are in the middle, and the foxes have achieved the max, and so on. There we go. And so, what we get is a pair, like a sine and a cosine. We get a pair of oscillating curves, where one is a quarter period behind the other. Do you, do you see how to transform from this to this? Anyone confused about this? Yeah. You are confused. Okay. Can I can you uh, voice the confusion? The whole circle. Okay. So this circle, so okay, so what is the process here? We look at these equations. We can't solve these equations. Well, actually we can't, but we can't solve these equations. Uh, actually, mostly we can't. We can't write a formula for these for the solution here, but we can understand how it behaves by looking at some a direction field where we notice that the direction field has zeros there and there, 
and then start applying an analysis about which way do things evolve by looking at just what happens to these two things. Are they positive, are they negative, are they big, are they small? This gives us a bunch of vectors that go around like that. So we can do something just like Euler's method. We can put this on the computer and easily plot it. Okay? But remember, this represents I'm not giving you time, I'm only giving you the number of foxes and the number of rabbits. And we can see that if the number of foxes is a little bit smaller than some number, and the number of rabbits is a little bit smaller than some other number, the rabbits will decrease while the foxes increase. Right? And then, if the rabbit population gets even bigger, the foxes will begin to increase because it's easy for them to find food. But the rabbits will continue to increase. But then when there's too many foxes, the foxes are very happy. Uh, when, there's, when there's a lot of rabbits and a lot of foxes, the foxes are very happy, but a lot of rabbits get eaten. And they get eaten enough that there's not enough fo uh, rabbits to support the foxes. And so then both populations die off. That's what this circle is representing. The circle is representing the number of rabbits and the number of foxes. You should think of this as a movie, where we just plot rabbits versus foxes, and this point moves around on a circle. We have a cyclic pattern of a population. It oscillates around some equilibrium state. If we prefer, we can just ignore the foxes entirely, Oops. We can just ignore, say, the rabbits entirely and look at the population of foxes. And we see something that looks like, well, sort of like a sine curve shifting. And if we ignore the foxes entirely and just look at the rabbits, we see the population of rabbits does the same kind of thing. Okay? All right. So, now, in this particular model, with the chosen A, B, C, and D, you always get these oscillatory patterns. But, as I said, this is not all that we would look at, is just this. It's important for you in many applications, and I mean, how many people have done these phase portraits in, say, physics? Zero people? Really? Okay, they use this in physics all the time. They also use it in biology and in chemistry and in lots of things. You're looking at, the, here we're looking at, instead of something that varies with time, we're looking at the ratio of two concentrations. We can certainly set this up with exactly the same model to describe a chemical equation that oscillates, where this is the concentration of one chemical and this is the concentration of another chemical. Um, You can certainly imagine, and if we tweak this thing a little bit, so in fact, let me tweak it a little bit, suppose that this is not how they, they evolved instead. So suppose that we know that, uh, well, actually, let me, before I do that, notice that the signs of these numbers, A, B, C, and D, tell you whether the predator, who's the predator and who's the prey. Right? When I write down an equation like dx dt is 3x times 1 plus 4xy dy dt is, uh, let's make that negative, 2, 2y times 1 minus 1 half x y. You should be able to read off from this who is the predator and who is the prey. If we multiply this out, oops, this is supposed to be minus two. Uh, yeah. If we multiply 
multiply this out, then we can see these things, the x's, whatever they are, tend to die off in the absence of y's. But when y's are around, it gives them a boost. And the y things are happily, are very happy when there's no x's, they grow. But in the presence of the x's, they die. So this is the prey, and this is the predator. So just from the equations, we can figure out which does what by looking at the sign of how the various things are affected. Now you can imagine that maybe we want to tweak this a little bit. Maybe instead of being, maybe these, maybe the predators are not uh, carnivores, they're omnivores. So they can live just fine without the prey around, but uh, they also eat them. So that would change this sign. We would still have a predator-prey situation, but these predators now become omnivores. They eat the prey, but they also eat the grass, or maybe the berries. So if we change this to a plus, we still have a predator-prey situation, but the behavior is quite different. That would reverse the arrows here in the vertical direction. So things would behave differently. Um, we can also imagine that maybe we have two species that are mutually beneficial. What would change if we had two species which evolve, which reproduce merrily on their own, but in the presence of each other, they're mutually beneficial? Yeah. Then both of the signs would be net positive. Also, if we have a, a species, each of which preys on the other, then both of the signs would be negative. So we have all these variations here. Another thing that we could throw into the mix is imagine that uh, instead of being uh, growing exponentially, these, they compete for resources. So there's limited resources. How would we modify this equation? Where do I have the equation? So suppose I have a situation where there's two species and um, there's two species, one of them preys on the other, so uh, I think aphids and ladybugs work this way. I think they compete for the resources that the ladybugs eat from aphids. So, So in this case, they both compete for the resources, which is like the flowers and so on. But um, the, the ladybugs eat the aphids. So we have limited resources. So so we want something like how do the aphids? grow in the absence of ladybugs. There's a limited amount of food for them. So what kind of what kind of model would we have to describe that? Yeah. Yeah. So we might use a logistic model here to say that in the absence of anything, uh, what letters did we use here? I don't even remember. K, A, 1 minus A over M. So in the absence of any ladybugs, we would have something like that. And let's, just so that I, let's call it K1 and M1. So the system has a carrying capacity of a certain number of aphids. And in the absence of ladybugs, that's how it behaves. And similarly, the ladybugs in the absence of aphids 
they can get by. Oops, not B, L. They would have some kind of logistic model. But the ladybugs eat the aphids. So they get a boost, uh, some other number, every time they meet. So we would have something like this. And similarly, these guys, I'm going to call it C. Um, would get some, they would get eaten. So there would be some harm to them. So this would give us a different kind of a picture here. This would give us something. Let me just try and draw the, not go through all the details. So, of course, if there's none of anything, we get a fixed point here. But if we look at, say, aphids and ladybugs, um, the aphid population wants to grow to some certain amount, but then it has a carrying capacity here of M1. And similarly, the ladybug population wants to grow to some certain amount, but then there's a carrying capacity here of M2. And above that, they would tend to die off. So it's a much more complicated system. And again, if these things are appropriate, there's some solution here. And we have a much more complicated behavior. We might see something like, so they would both grow, but they're limited, and maybe they'll spiral in like that. We might see other things too. So, depending on all of these numbers, you might see lots of varieties here. So, let me just forget about the equations and just think about the setup for a few minutes. So suppose that I have a solution in the phase plane that looks like that. And let's just call these x's and y's. What does this tell me that the graph of y of t looks like? Is there only one person in the room who has a clue? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it will oscillate, but then eventually it will be just like Yeah, so it's going to limit on this value. So here, we start with a low value of y's. They increase, and they increase until they reach this height. And then they decrease, actually it looks like fairly rapidly until they get to this height here, and then they begin to increase again. But they don't increase quite as much, they only get this high. And then they decrease a little less, and then they increase, and then it's a little hard to tell. So again, imagine we're traversing this and this is telling us what's happening to the height. We're ignoring the uh, horizontal component and only looking at the height, but thinking of traversing this curve. And as you traverse this curve, you go up and down, then up and down, then up and down. And you go up and down less and less. And a similar kind of graph goes on for the x's. There's a little delay between them between the bumps and bumps. Now, what else have we seen that looks like this? It was just about a week ago. Yeah. Yeah, springs. Exactly. There's no accident that this looks kind of like what we saw in the spring equation. 
In fact, so this is where you see this in physics all the time. If I have a differential equation, like that, a second order linear differential equation, I can turn it into something like this by a little trick. I can say, let's suppose that y is the derivative of x. There's no x here. This is a function of t. So I introduce a new variable x. If you imagine that, that, that y is representing the position, then x is the velocity. And if I let y prime be x, then this equation, so that means The second derivative is the derivative of x. The acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So if y prime is x, then this equation becomes x prime plus bx plus cy equals 0. And then I can solve for x prime here. Of course, it's upside down, but that's okay. Like this. So now I have a system of two equations, depending on x and y, in some sense very similar to what we're doing in the predator-prey situation, where I have two equations, their derivatives depend on their values, on their joint values. So I have the derivative of x is some function of x and y, and the derivative of y is some function of x and y. And I can make a phase picture for such a thing. And depending on what happens to B and C, this exactly tells us whether we see a picture that goes spiraling around, spiraling in, goes off in two directions, or whatever. So exactly the kind, but here we can solve it explicitly. So this sort of thing, where people make these kinds of, let me, so, I, I know I asked this before. How many of you are engineers? How many of you are physics? <coughs> Many of you are other stuff. Okay, I'm just trying to see you know, how hands go. How many of you expect to take more physics? Okay. So they do this kind of thing in physics all the time, where they make what's called a phase portrait. Let's say for the spring system. So if I write down this equation or the spring, then I put the velocity here, and I put the position here. And the kind of spring that we saw, it goes down and up and blah, 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 like that, would have something where, so say this is position zero, so it would have something so the position is the horizontal, where we would see a solution like that. And this is describing exactly the motion of the spring. The kind of spring that we see that there's no friction corresponds to something that just goes around. The velocity, so when the spring, the, notice that when we have a spring that's going boink, kaboink, 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 then the position is changing, and when it's at the bottom, the velocity is zero. And when it's at the top, the velocity is at zero. So when the position is at its max, or its min, the velocity is zero. So we see exactly 
this kind of a situation. Um, and also the other situations correspond to different pictures in the phase portrait. So, this stuff with the phase portraits of the second order equations, this is not on the exam, there's no homework on it, but if you do more physics, you will see it for sure. Okay, so, um, one more announcement. There's going to be one additional web assigned homework. There's one due on Wednesday, there will be another one due after the class ends. It's about five or six problems. It's on this predator prey stuff. And the remaining classes, I'm just going to start reviewing. We covered all the material.